After sitting down and watching Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin, it only felt right to do an immediate follow-up video about Joel Schumacher's Batman Forever. Just like Batman and Robin, I've never fully seen Batman Forever until I decided to watch this movie for this video. Spoiler alert, I like this movie, and I didn't expect to like it as much as I do. It's not that I had any certain expectations, but I'm so used to watching old superhero movies and having negative opinions about them that having such a positive opinion after watching Batman Forever feels amazing. It does so many things right, even though I did have a problem with maybe fewer than a handful of things in this movie. It's so good that I genuinely think it'll become a movie that I find myself re-watching more often than not. Batman Forever has almost every single thing you'd want in a Batman film. A retelling of the origins of Bruce Wayne while managing to actively dive into his trauma, a beautifully put together Gotham City that still maintained its dark and gritty tone, ridiculous over the top villains with motives that make Santa could only exist within the city of Gotham, a decent to somewhat likable Batman, and on top of that, a lovable Alfred that makes an impact on on Bruce. While it has its flaws, I'm almost willing to put those flaws aside and essentially call this movie an almost masterpiece. Thanks to the last video, the bat signals already lit up, so let's not waste any more time. It's time that we dive into Joel Schumacher's Batman Forever. This should go without saying, but Batman is my favorite superhero. I adore the universe of Gotham. I love the Batman villains, and I especially love that the things that go on within Gotham can only exist in Gotham. With that being said, Joel Schumacher's Batman Forever captures the essence of Gotham in almost every single way possible while maintaining the exact tone of a comic book. There are quirky moments from characters like the Riddler, there are serious moments that require self-reflection, there are beautifully done set pieces that bring Gotham to life, and on top of that, there are still moments that visually feel like a comic book, such as the Riddler's headquarters towards the end of Batman Forever. Does this movie still have that 90s aesthetic that's easily seeable when you watch one of these 90s superhero movies during the modern era? Absolutely! But Schumacher perfectly captures the essence of what a Batman movie should have looked like during the 90s era. I'd never made a comic book before and it's just great for the imagination because you're not dealing with real life. Imagination is a long lost element of superhero movies. Superhero movies now feel like they're so focused on being realistic that it almost feels like they forgot that they're superhero movies. A big reason why I love Batman Forever is that Joel used his imagination to create this movie. Whether it's the pacing, characters, visual colors, set pieces, over the top action, or even the feeling of Gotham City, Batman Forever feels exactly like how a person may feel when they pick up and read a Batman comic. Previously, I said this in my Batman and Robin video, the idea of Bruce Wayne, let alone Batman, is ridiculous. It's ridiculous to buy into the idea of this dark and brooding billionaire bachelor running around as a superhero saving the crime-filled city of Gotham. Luckily, Batman Forever immediately positively fires back at my opinion. Admittedly, I didn't initially buy into Val Kilmer's iteration of Bruce Wayne. At the beginning of the movie, he comes off as an emotionally cold Bruce Wayne that shows no signs of growth occurring throughout this movie. I was wrong. In Batman Forever, Bruce Wayne struggles with his trauma, so much so that he actively speaks to a psychologist named Chase Meridian. Of course, the lines get blurred and Chase ends up falling in love with Bruce, but the point is that Batman Forever's Bruce Wayne is more than just a dark and brooding billionaire. For once, narratively, Bruce being this quiet, suffering man who's struggling with his parents' death, even as an adult, makes sense, despite the concept of him becoming Batman being absolutely ridiculous. The figure in the dark was my destiny. It would change my life forever. 
I know, this scene feels corny and comes off as a stupid way of telling the viewer where the origin of Batman comes from, but if we're being honest, didn't that scene feel like it came directly out of a comic book? We've actively seen worse, and yes, I'm looking at you, Batman v Superman, but the point I'm trying to make is that a scene like this requires imagination. It requires the ability to be able to picture this happening, whether you're either watching this movie, watching any other superhero movie that has a ridiculous origin, or even when you're reading a comic book. That scene isn't meant to be realistic like we're used to seeing in modern superhero movies. It's meant to fit the narrative of this story and showcase not only Bruce's trauma that he actively grows out of throughout the movie, but the imagination that's also required to buy into the concept of a fictional superhero character that we know and love. The best part about Batman Forever showcasing Bruce's trauma is that this movie shows how Bruce uses his trauma to actively do good outside of just being Batman. Sure, he runs around this crime-filled city, has his bat signal that the GCPD uses, and is a well-known phenomenon throughout this city. Cool, we've seen that before. In fact, we've seen it almost a million times by now. What good can he do outside of that? How can we at least be shown that he's learning to grow out of this trauma without dedicating several seasons to exist? exhibit this growth. Schumacher perfectly answers these questions. We're the same. If we're the same, Bruce, help me. All right, train me, let me be your partner. No. What's a good sidekick name? How about Dick Grace and college students? Screw you. I just saved your life. You owe me. You are totally out of control. You're gonna get yourself killed. Robin. Robin's role in this movie is more than just being at the same circus that Two-Face takes over so that we can see Robin's origin story. Robin's relationship with Bruce forces Bruce to look at himself in the mirror so to speak, and because of that, Bruce actively tries to prevent Robin from becoming a vigilante. Bruce sees himself in Robin and sees the potential road that Robin will go down if he actively commits to teaching Robin how to be a superhero. Due to him seeing this, initially, he doesn't want to do that. There's absolutely no hesitation in Bruce's decision when he says no, even though he realizes that Robin will likely hate him for making that decision. He doesn't want Robin to have anything to do with his fight against the Riddler and Two-Face, who I'll be diving into soon. It's not about Bruce having an ego, it's not about Bruce not wanting to do it because he doesn't want the credit or responsibility, it's because Bruce doesn't want Robin to use his trauma for the wrong reasons or in the same vein as he did. Even when Bruce feels like Alfred is encouraging Robin despite Bruce not wanting Robin to go down the same path as he did, Alfred has the perfect response that makes Bruce ponder how to further approach his relationship with Robin. You above all should know the consequences of the life you choose. The importance of these aforementioned moments is that they allowed Schumacher to build a creative and believable universe where Batman exists and he's struggling for an actual reason. This universe is a universe where characters are forced to be self-aware so they can grow from their struggles and overcome what's holding them back instead of being self-aware for the sake of humor. This isn't a knock against Batman and Robin. In fact, I love Batman and Robin, and if you haven't seen my video about it, I genuinely encourage you to watch it. However, there's such a stark difference in these movies when you look at how Schumacher uses the self-aware mechanism for his storytelling. In Batman and Robin, the entire universe is loud, comedic, colorful, and purposely entertaining. The characters are making funny self-aware jokes while fighting each other, saying puns that purposely connect with what they're doing and have a ton of fun 90s references such as Robin screaming cowabunga. Together, these things serve the exact purpose that they needed to serve for Batman and Robin, being an enjoyable, family-friendly movie that'll sell toys. 
In Batman Forever, the self-awareness of these characters force our core characters to look at themselves and grow from the position shown at the beginning of the movie. Bruce goes from this dark, brooding, and quiet, suffering man to realizing that he needs to grow from his trauma so that he can steer Robin down a good path. Robin is this emotionally traumatized young man that makes dumb decisions to run away from himself but is eventually forced to confront that in multiple heated moments with Bruce. Robin eventually grows out of this as Alfred openly guides him and intentionally gives Bruce a moment of self-reflection so he can take another approach to his relationship with Robin. Even Dr. Meridian grows from her weird obsession with Batman due to the mystery around him to falling in love with Bruce instead after spending a ton of time with Bruce throughout the movie. The point of these characters isn't to be serious just to be serious or having internal struggles just to have internal struggles. The point of these characters is that they all have something going on internally and throughout the movie they're all learning how to grow from these internal struggles. In the context of Batman Forever, these creative decisions make sense. It matches the tone you'd expect when you think of Batman in the crime-filled city of Gotham where everyone has their own ongoing struggles and traumatic backstory. Stories. It lives up to Schumacher's idea that using imagination is important when you make a film like Batman Forever because it allows this type of storytelling to make sense overall and it allows the viewer to find themselves invested in the movie. The question becomes, how do you counter this level of depth and the seriousness coming from these characters and their backstories so that you can make an enjoyable superhero movie? That's where the villains come in. Before I dive into giving Jim Carrey the praise that he rightfully deserves for his performance as the Riddler, it's time that I addressed arguably the worst part of Batman Forever. Tommy Lee Jones' iteration of Two-Face. I'm well aware that this is far from a popular opinion, but it's not good and it's the one thing that prevents Batman Forever from being a masterpiece. It's not even bad to the point where you can simply laugh at it. His take on Two-Face just straight up sucks. It's been well documented that TLJ despised every single second he was on set. I mean, look at him describing Harvey in this interview about his role in Batman Forever. Uh, Harvey essentially, you know, believes that the only true order in society is chaos. Riveting stuff there, Tommy Lee Jones. You'd think that me calling his take on Two-Face inconsistent would be a good thing considering it's Two-Face we're talking about here, but nope, it's inconsistent in the most frustrating way possible. The beginning of Batman Forever showcases a Two-Face with potential, a Two-Face that isn't afraid to go places and put Batman into deep waters, which he did but with acid water, and while Batman was locked inside of a vault, you can see that there was some level of conscious effort put into the beginning section, hell, he even does the bare minimum of using Two-Face's iconic coin to help make decisions at the beginning of the movie. However, halfway through the movie, his presence begins to feel like a waste of everyone's time. He's just running around acting like he doesn't even belong in this movie. After the first 20 or so minutes, there's little to no effort being put into this character. He stops being faithful to the Two-Face character, he makes stupid one-liners that wouldn't even land in Batman and Robin, and he's just laughing at things that aren't funny at all. It almost feels like a poor man's Joker, but with Two-Face makeup, that's how out of character he is after the beginning of the movie. It's so bad that you can tell that TLJ signed up for this movie for two reasons, the first being his kid and the second being a paycheck. You can tell that he wanted nothing to do with this movie, and that's the truth. He said, well send me the script. So I sent him overnight the script. He said, I don't get it. I don't get it. Why do you want me in this picture? 
The funniest part about his Two-Face is that he vanishes around halfway through Batman Forever, just like everything you'd expect to see from any iteration of Two-Face during a Batman movie, show, or video game. He stops using his coin, he doesn't necessarily have any inner conflict that's shown between his two personalities, there's no backstory to get us to buy into his character like there is with the Riddler, and it's an all-around half-assed job. I can't even necessarily Necessarily blame the fact that these things are missing on Schumacher because the theatrical cut of Batman Forever isn't his entire vision of the movie. There's a three hour Schumacher cut out there somewhere in the WB archives and it goes without saying, but release the Schumacher cut, thank you very much. Even if there is some level of depth in TLJ's version of Two Face that was cut from the theatrical version of Batman Forever, I highly doubt that it'd redeem his character whatsoever. TLJ leaves little to be desired, and if this is what they were willing to show the audience, imagine what the unseen footage looks like. Even though TLJ's Two-Face is the number one complaint I have regarding Batman Forever, it's fairly easy to excuse this half-assed effort since he disappears halfway through the movie. So realistically, I can't even necessarily be that mad about him. He's nowhere to be found, they don't even say why he's gone, they don't say what he's up to, they don't say if he's working on some grandmaster plan while Riddler's rising to fame in Gotham, they don't even mention Two-Face's name whatsoever. And you wanna know why I love this? I love this because it lets Jim Carrey shine as the Riddler. This may or may not be a controversial statement, but this needs to be said. Batman Forever didn't need Two-Face at all. Jim Carrey is brilliant in almost every single way possible in his role as the Riddler, and he didn't need any co-stars whatsoever. He's so good as Ed Nigma that it is ridiculous. Watching him rapidly spiral as he changes from an oddball who's obsessed with Bruce Wayne even though Bruce barely knows anything about him, to this pissed off but confident mastermind that actively tries to one up Bruce Wayne is phenomenal. When you think about it, his arc makes a ton of sense. The man is obsessed with Bruce. He even has pictures in his workspace and his cramped apartment. On top of that, he publicly admits to Bruce that he's his idol and when Bruce shuts down the funding for his project called The Box, which can control human minds, which is why Bruce decided to shut down additional funding for his project, it immediately begins his spiral. The unhealthy obsession gets to him, his world crashes, he essentially feels insulted. He becomes obsessed with the idea of proving that his box is a brilliant idea to the point where he kills a man doing his first human trial, but the experiment changes the entirety of his persona. The usage of this box turns him into an absolute madman while maintaining Ed's quirky, oddball personality, and it makes for this perfectly balanced villain. You can feel his presence in Gotham. You can feel how he's negatively affecting the people of Gotham. And the movie sells that by showing us the effect of his inventions via a news report. And throughout all of this, he's constantly sending Bruce puzzles to solve so he can put together the pieces to purposely reveal his identity to Bruce. It's straight up comic book shit, and I love every second of it. It is so good. Jim Carrey never needed a co-star to sell this movie. It could have been nothing but Batman and Robin versus the Riddler, and this movie would have still been phenomenal. The concept of the Riddler in Batman Forever makes you think only in Gotham could this nonsense happen, and that's exactly what you want out of a Batman movie. You want the villains to feel like they can only execute their plans in Gotham City. You want the villains to feel like they're actively messing up Bruce's life. You want the villains to nearly take over Gotham only for Batman and Robin to save the day and that's exactly what you get out of the Riddler. A perfect story about a quirky obsessive man who's shunned by his idol which leads to him becoming a villain only for him to have one of his quirks used against him to bring him down and save Gotham City. We didn't need Two-Face, he didn't even do anything meaningful but appear at the beginning of the movie and do one interesting thing 
until he inevitably becomes a pointless character. I understand why they paired Jim Carrey with another star, it sell more tickets, but I loved his iteration of the Riddler so much that I could have entirely done without the half-assed effort of TLJ. Truthfully, it says a lot, considering that the Riddler is typically more of a complimentary character that has the best of him brought out by other characters in the Batman universe. The fact that I can legitimately say that Jim Carrey could carry Batman Forever alone as the Riddler is insane and is a testament to the brilliance of Jim Carrey. It's a 10 out of 10 performance and there probably isn't a person out there that can change my mind. Despite Tommy Lee Jones' half-assed, low-effort Two-Face, Joel Schumacher's Batman Forever is quite arguably a flawed masterpiece. The idea of taking a psychological look into Batman's origins and making the characters have the internal struggles that they have to confront throughout the movie makes perfect sense. It's different, but it's not something that we see often in superhero movies. I love the idea of being able to look into the mind of Bruce Wayne and seeing why he operates the way he operates. I love that for once it feels like there's a reason as to why Bruce is cold rather than him having to be cold as a byproduct of his parents death without that aspect of him being unexplored. Rather than using trauma consistently over and over to the point where it almost feels mind numbing like it does in Titans, the concept of using trauma to tell Batman Forever's story feels meaningful. We finally get to understand that there's more to Bruce Wayne than his superhero outings and his money. We see how it affects him, how he reacts when someone with a similar situation wants to be like him, and for once, Bruce actually grows as a person. He doesn't ignore his problems, ignore Alfred's advice, or just use his emotions to take down henchmen to get information on a villain's major plan to take down Gotham. Batman Forever shows more than those cliches that are typically depicted in pieces of Batman media. On top of that, the art direction and the visuals reinforce the idea that Gotham City is an awful place despite Batman and Robin saving the day. In Batman Forever, Gotham City is a crime-filled place that has actual repercussions. People turn into villains, people suffer from legitimate internal struggles, living there is hard and it almost feels like the city needs Batman and Robin. The movie reinforces these thoughts by ending the movie with Batman and Robin running, assumingly, towards the Batmobile since the bat signal lights up. It's this ongoing symbiotic relationship that's a never-ending cycle that we've grown to accept. As fans, as movie watchers, and as comic book readers, we know that Batman saving Gotham over and over again will constantly be a thing that simply makes sense, and the ending of Batman Forever reiterates that without saying a single word. It's sad, but it's absolutely beautiful at the same exact time. As always, if you enjoy this video, hit that like button. If you really enjoy this video, hit that sub button. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, write a comment down below. Don't forget to keep it real with peace, love, and positivity.